talking about peace, okay? So we're going to talk about peace. So if you came and you thought, oh, the topic is prayer, that was previous, okay? So we're talking about peace. So let's start with a prayer. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, thank you. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. All right, one of the things I want to do as we continue to pray and talk about this workshop I'd like to share a scripture with you, um, and I want to do an expedited version of Lexio Divina. And what that is, that is a Latin word meaning sacred or divine reading. So I'm going to read a scripture a few times, and I just invite you to enter in to a scripture. It's a very short passage. So let's just take a deep breath. It's also the scripture on the screens. And this is from the Gospel of John. Peace I leave with you. My own peace I give you. A peace the world cannot give. This is my gift to you. Let not your hearts be troubled or afraid. Just to take a moment, let that sink in. I'm going to read it again, and I want you to think about if maybe there's a word or a phrase that sticks out. Peace I leave with you. My own peace I give you. A peace the world cannot give. This is my gift to you. Let not your hearts be troubled or afraid. I'm going to read it a third time, and I'd like you to think about what is the Lord trying to speak to you? Peace I leave with you. My own peace I give you. A peace the world cannot give. This is my gift to you. Let not your hearts be troubled or afraid. All right. Awesome. So my challenge for you as we just went that very expedited version of Lexio Divina, what I want you to do maybe during dinner, find someone who is also here and share what you think the Lord might be speaking to you or putting on your heart in regards to that scripture. I want to start this workshop by talking, sharing with you all two stories. So the first story is I grew up in a parish where there were religious sisters, and they were religious sisters who wore the habit, they had a rosary, a veil, and I remember when I was in high school, I was attending this mission that these religious sisters were putting on, and I went to this mission, and I thought, wow, it was religious sisters who were up in front of the church talking about Jesus, talking about their faith, talking about their vocation, their surrender, their yes to God. They had so much joy. It was like they radiated joy. They had this glow. And at the time, I couldn't really articulate what they had, but I knew I wanted it in a sense of they had peace. And I asked the sister one time, I said, Sister, like, how do you have so much peace? And she said, because my life is centered on prayer. My life is centered on prayer. How do we have peace? We acknowledge we can have peace through having a relationship with Jesus. Second story I wanted to share. I, when I was in graduate school, we had to do six-week rotations. So I went to a different internship site every six weeks. And this one site they sent me to, it was an end-of-life hospice center. So it was people who would go, they were very sick, they were terminally ill, and they were preparing to die. 
and I was a counseling student, so I was getting my master's in counseling. I'm sent to this hospice site, and I talked to a lot of people. Um, it was a very beautiful, very blessed, very anointed time talking to these people who were getting ready to die, and I remember talking to this one lady, and uh, the lady, she, I had a great bond with her. So every time I would come in, I would go and I'd visit with her, I'd sit with her, talk to her. And one of my questions that I asked her, are you scared? Are you scared to die? And her answer was profound and I still reflect on it this day. She said, Kelly, I'm at peace. And I thought, wow, like someone who's sick, who's in pain, who has suffered for the last several years, I ask her, are you ready? Are you scared? And she says, Kelly, I'm at peace. And honestly, I, I was scared for her. And I was kind of jealous at the same time that she had this great, inner peace and I was jealous of the religious sisters because they had this peace about them they just exuded peace and I just wanted to be in their presence and before we actually go into some practical steps how we gain peace I'd love to just share a little and I'd love to hear from all of you what are some things that take away our peace? What are some distractions? What are some things that distract us from living a life of prayer, from living and pursuing a life of peace that distract us or that take away our peace? So I just kind of wrote a list of stuff for me and I think it's very relatable. So what does not bring us peace? Social media, social media is great. When we post things that are good, true, and beautiful and spreading the good news, that is awesome. But sometimes social media, we could maybe be addicted to it, we could be overconsumed by it, we could be constantly staring at our phones, not in the present moment. Sometimes social media can take our peace. Toxic relationships. So I'm not just talking about relationships that may be unhealthy with a boyfriend or girlfriend. Maybe an unhealthy friendship, maybe a group of friends who don't bring you any peace, they actually take you down. They take you down to the path of darkness. Maybe they say negative or crude comments. That can take away our peace. Being worried about if your family has money or doesn't have money. Being so consumed of, I have to be a millionaire when I grow up. I'm gonna do whatever it takes. Chasing happiness. Happiness is something that is fleeting. God wants to give us joy and God wants to give us peace. Self-reliance, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, saying, I can do everything. I don't need anyone. I can do everything. Thinking about, I have to go to the best college. I have to be the star sports player. I have to be the star in the musical. Being so consumed that we have to be put on a pedestal. The pursuit of perfection. No one is perfect except God. We are not perfect. When I recognize that, as I say this to you, as I'm a recovering perfectionist, when I recognize that, it just took this weight off my shoulder. Being worried about impressing people or what others are going to say about us. That does not bring us peace. That drags us down. Holding grudges, unforgiveness in our heart, bitterness, sin, all of these things, this list, it goes on and on and on. There's a lot of things, if we look at our lives, we look at our daily interactions, what we're doing, that doesn't bring us peace. And before I go into four specific ways that can kind of take away our peace, I want to talk about what peace is. So when you think about peace, it's the serenity. It's knowing that we are right with God, we are right with ourselves, and right with others. So it's being in a good relationship. 
And it's knowing that we can only attain peace through having a relationship with Jesus. I'm going to say that again because that's key. We can only attain peace through a relationship with Jesus. So this book that I'm referencing a lot today, it's called Searching and Maintaining Peace. Searching for and Maintaining Peace. It's in the bookstore. It's by Father Jacques Philippe. Uh, He's a French priest who talks uh, all over the country about great, great things. He has another great book, Interior Freedom. Um, But in his book, he identifies four things that rob us of our peace. So let's go a little bit deeper here. So the first is the troubles of life and the fear of being without. So sometimes, especially as young people, high school, people who are, you know, moving on, uh, college, whatever's after high school, we could be so consumed with FOMO. I'm here this weekend, but I'm missing something really important at home. I'm here this weekend, but I'm thinking about the person who's texting me. You know, we can lack this, like, present day attitude, this present day, like, living in the present, and we're consumed We could think, I'm, I have to do everything right now so I get into the perfect college. Things like that, the troubles of life and the fear of being without, if I don't do something and I'm gon- not going to be able to accomplish point A and then point B and then point C. So recognizing God gives us everything we need. All we have to do is ask him and rely on him. Again, he is the starting point for peace. The second, others' faults and shortcomings. So sometimes we could be so consumed by like, well, they were supposed to do that, but they didn't do that, or they lacked integrity, or they did that. We can kind of, you know, have the attitude of pointing the finger at someone else. Or we can say, well, it's their fault. Sometimes it really is the fault of others but we shouldn't let that rob us of our peace. We shouldn't let that rob us of our peace. The the third, our own faults and shortcomings. So I think sometimes we can kind of be consumed in uh, like the woe is me um, or the the lie of self-reliance, believing like I have to do everything and when we have to do everything and we pursue to do everything and that is the only thing and that is the only option, that can take away our peace. That can rob us of our peace. And the fourth, the fear of suffering, and perhaps this might be the greatest. Sometimes what takes away our peace or robs us of our peace is knowing we might have to do something really difficult, but it's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. So maybe we avoid it or we don't do it. But the thing is, we have to go through the cross to get to the resurrection. We have to go through the cross to get to the resurrection. Suffering is part of life. It ain't easy. It's tough. But we can walk through suffering and we can endure pain and suffering because we have a God who never leaves us and who is always there. So now transitioning to, okay, these are the things that take away our peace. These are the things that rob us of this peace we so desire and we so want. How can we attain peace at a practical level? How can we do things this weekend? How could we start right now with this workshop to gain more peace? So kind of broke this up into three different sections here, three different practical sections. So the first is anchoring ourselves, anchoring ourselves. So let's talk about this, finding our voice. So knowing like, okay, we hold a lot of things in as high school students. So we hold a lot of things in like being able to communicate our feelings, being able to articulate, hey, this is how I'm doing to our friends, to our family. We also endure a lot of things as high school students, as young adults. So being able to say, okay, I have a lot going on. I can't take it all. Mom and dad, I need your help. 
friends, I need your help. Sometimes we need to seek professional help. We need to seek counselors. And if you think, oh, if I go to a counselor, I'm going to be judged, or there's the stigma associated with it. That is a lie. Do not believe that lie. If you need to go to counseling, go to counseling. There was a time um, my mom was very sick. She was actually in a coma for nearly four years, and I was really, really struggling. And I had to seek counseling because I couldn't do it myself. If you have to, it's okay. I would encourage that. Practicing self-care. So knowing, like, okay, I have a lot going on. Like, I need to do something for me. Maybe it means going for a jog or exercising, going for a walk going to sit in a coffee shop, bookstore, whatever makes you feel good and whatever is something you enjoy, that's self-care. We need to take care of ourselves. Eating healthy. I'll let you in on a little secret for like the past two months. I have not had any sugar or very little sugar. And it was because I was eating very unhealthy. Heck yeah, awesome. Uh, I was eating super unhealthy, pizza, mint chocolate chip ice cream for breakfast, bacon, I mean, just very unhealthy. And I, I had to make a change. So recognizing, okay, like, when I eat healthy, like, wholeness, wellness of my body, that helps. Remembering you are not alone. You are never alone. You have God, you have your family, you have friends, you have all the people you came with. You are not alone. And then limiting screen time. Our iPhones are wonderful. Smartphones, iPhones, I'm an iPhone person. They are wonderful. We can connect with so many people, but at the same time, we have to recognize it's important to limit our screen time. All right, the second, anchoring our social sphere. Uh, so being able to say no, being able to set limits on your schedule. I know for me, saying no is really hard because it's like I want to do everything. I want to be connected to people. I want to hang out with all my friends. I do struggle with FOMO as well. Um, so I want to do all these things, and sometimes I overcommit or overextend myself. And then, like, my experience as a result of that is, like, I feel empty. I feel dry. So recognizing it's okay to say no. Especially it's okay to say no to things that don't bring you life. Setting a schedule could be very helpful. And just setting good, healthy limits and boundaries in our life. There's a book I read several years ago. It's called Boundaries. You read it in marriage prep as well, from what I'm told. Um, it, it was amazing to go through and to read that. So if you're a reader, I jot that down, boundaries. Great, great book. And then the last is breathe. And I want to share this quote uh, from a philosopher here. All right, here we go. This is Blaise Pascal. He's a philosopher. All of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room. So sometimes we fear silence, sometimes we need that constant noise, but it's okay just to breathe sometimes, and that can make a difference. All right, last, anchoring our souls. So recognizing, like I said, Jesus is the starting point for peace. We cannot have peace unless we have Jesus and unless we have a relationship with God. Living in the truth of God is love, God loves you, God desires you, God wants you, God chooses you, and recognizing you don't have to do anything. So li living in the basic truth of who you are can make all the difference. Daily prayer. If you don't pray on a daily basis, I would encourage you, start with five minutes a day. After a month, increase it to 10 minutes a day and slowly increase it. Having daily prayer is a game changer. 
It is a game changer. Father Mike just talked about the importance of prayer. So committing to daily prayer. And then the last, surrender. You know, ultimately, we're working towards saying yes to Jesus. Jesus, I surrender to your will. Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I surrender to you. Again, recognizing all these things and some things we can do very quickly, like limit, limit our screen time, limit the amount of time we FaceTime people, praying, starting to pray, getting into this daily prayer rhythm. All of these things can help us on our path to peace. All of these things can help us attain peace, to live more peacefully. The last thing I want to share with you, and then we're going to do a little Q&A. It's from C.S. Lewis, The Weight of Glory. Idols will always break our hearts. And what I want to say about this is, sometimes we think, if only I could have this, then I will be happy. If only this happens, or I have to do one more thing so I get to the next step. Idols will always break our hearts. Be at peace knowing Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Peace comes through having Jesus in your life. Peace comes through having a personal relationship with Jesus. All right, well, at this, let's uh, end with a prayer, and I'm going to actually share this prayer with you. It's from St. Teresa of Avila. It's a beautiful prayer about peace. Uh, so let's end, and then we'll do Q&A. If anyone has questions, we have a mic. There's also some that you submitted. So let's just end. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. And again, I'm going to read the St. Teresa of Avila prayer. Let nothing upset you. Let nothing startle you. All things pass. God does not change. Patience wins all it seeks. Whoever has God lacks nothing. God alone is enough. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Awesome. So I went through pretty quick, um, so I'd love to take any questions. I'm going to pull up my laptop and uh, start asking the questions uh, that you all submitted. I also invited Kyle if he wants to come up and we'll tag team this Q&A session as well. All right. All right, so the first question uh, that someone submitted through the app is, how do I let go of control? How do I let go of control? I'm just gonna move this. Do you wanna start, Kyle? Yeah, I think there are some things that are good to be in control of, and there's things that are dangerous to hold on to. Um, you know, the previous, session workshop was on prayer like we need to take control of our prayer life if we don't it's not going to happen you know but there's also things that are outside of our control and we got to recognize like we can't control how other people treat us we can choose if we're around them potentially i mean if they're family maybe that's more difficult so it, i think it, it's partially recognizing what we can control and we can't and what we can't control like you, can, you don't control it. Like you, like you got to recognize that I, I have no power over this, so it's not my fault. Um, and just do the best you can with it. Yeah, I agree. And I think the biggest thing is recognizing ultimately I am not the one in control. Even though I might want to be the one in control, even though maybe some of us tend to have more of like a Type A personality, like we need something. But ultimately, we're not the one in control. And I think once we recognize that, we can actually come to greater peace with that. Awesome. Okay, so next question. It, it, and this question is actually very similar, but it has a little, little more to the front end. So how do you deal 
with anger and anxiety when things are out of your control? How do you deal with anger and anxiety when things are out of your control? Great question. Um, I think, again, recognition. So recognize, like, okay, where are you? Um, what, what is taking place that you are feeling anxious? What is taking place that you have anger? One, I think it'd be really important to articulate that to someone you trust. Like, why are you having these feelings? And those feelings are very natural, they're normal. Lots of people experience anxiety and, and anger. Um, but as a result of that, when you lose control of, of a situation or something like that, always coming back to a place of knowing who you are and knowing who God is and seeking God, taking that to God in prayer. I'm not saying like praying away feelings we have and strong feelings we have, but giving that to God and knowing you're not in it alone, but God is meeting you there. I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, and with anxiety, I mean, there is counseling, there's medication that might be something to look into. Like I'm not a doctor, I'm not claiming to be, but like there's also medical and emotional ways to deal with it. And so not to assume like everything is something that you can control on your own. Yeah, and I think also recognizing um, like maybe I, like I need to take this to talk to someone. Like maybe it's becoming too overwhelming for like my daily interactions or my daily life and my schedule. And again, um, I think that's really important to recognize and then to seek action, to seek help. Whether that's from a professional, someone at your school, a family member, um, depending on what it is. And then also like all of the things that you just went through in your, your presentation of, of like things to avoid and things to do put those into practice, those are good tips. All right, my good, fr my good friend and I are having some issues and I don't know what to do. Maybe if you submit that one more time and be a little more specific um, in regards to the issue. So I would say if you feel like you're in an unhealthy relationship with a friend in regards to like a friendship, um, to have a good honest conversation about it, to be able to share your feelings, share how it affects you. Um, if if you feel like maybe um, it's something very serious or your friend um, you know, is in danger in any way, definitely to seek guidance from adults. Um, people um, like youth leaders, chaperones, definitely seek guidance in that regard. And also pray. Um, I think sometimes like that's, a, like that's an easy answer for us to say like, oh, let's just pray. But like, let's be in daily conversation with God. Um, let's, again, we are not on this journey alone, but let's pray. I don't know if you want to say anything. All right. All right, next question. Sorry, I had to, like, read through and make sure I didn't miss any. Okay. Um, how do you deal with overanalyzing yourself? Gr gr great question. How do you deal with overanalyzing yourself? I, I guess, I mean, there's, it's, it's kind of a fine line of like what is overanalyzing because I think we, we do need to be conscious of, of what we're doing and, and keep ourselves in check. Um, maybe one version of that would be scrupulosity, you know, that um, we need to be aware of our, our sins, for example, and, and be honest with ourselves and say, this is something that I, I'm struggling with. What can I do to help avoid situations that put me into that sin, whatever. Um, over, like, almost like a, an OCD, like an obsessive compulsive, like where you're you're finding things that aren't even since like, oh, no, I uh, accidentally only prayed nine Hail Marys in this decade of the rosary. Now I need to go to confession or something like that. I, that's kind of an exaggeration. But uh, if we're just really agonizing over some of the less important things, overanalyzing, um, you know, that's a, a, a good thing to take to prayer, good thing to maybe mention in confession. Like, hey, look, I, I keep on worrying about these things. Uh, but again, like 
OCD is, is something that there is help for. Um, mm -hmm. Again, like counseling, therapy, uh, potentially medication, things like that. So I, I think we have to be careful about thinking, again, that I'm in control of ev everything, that if there's a problem, then I can fix it on my own, but to seek out help. Awesome, and the next question was actually about um, what, what you talked about, so it was great. Okay, next question. How do you forgive yourself and find peace and trust after being in a hostile relation, an abusive relationship. Oh, I'm sorry, sexually abusive relationship. Again, great, great question, and, and thanks, um, thanks to all of you who have submitted these questions. Um, so I'll share with you really quick. I think for us, in regards to like unforgiveness, in regards to self-forgiveness, I think that's really hard because I think we can go to confession and we can seek God and we understand like God is all loving and he's all forgiving and he will always forgive, forgive us when we ask of it. And I think that, that makes sense in a very logical way with ourselves. I think even, so we could seek God and forgiveness and, and that sits well with us. I think going to other people, we could go to other people, apologize to them uh, when we were at fault and they accept our apology, and that sits well with us as well. But I think sometimes the hardest forgiveness is going, like getting over self-forgiveness. And I think sometimes when you think about this, like we are our own worst critic, right? Does that make sense? Sometimes we are our own worst critic. So we judge ourselves the worst. When we look in a mirror, oftentimes we look at all of our flaws instead of saying, wow, this is the life God this is who I am, and this is who God made me to be. Um, so I think self-forgiveness is definitely um, challenging, and it could give you more obstacles than the others. Um, in regards to how do you forgive yourself if you've been in a, let me make sure I get this right, a hostile, sexually abusive relationship. First of all, I'm sorry, that is something very tough that someone has been through, multiple people have been through, unfortunately. Um, so that's something very, very tough. That's something that creates drama and causes drama because of an abusive relationship. Um, so I think the first thing to do is to talk to someone you trust about it. So you're a young person, I would say talk to a mentor, talk to an adult who you trust, that you're able to share what happened. Because it's one thing when we hold it all in, but there's a certain peace and freedom when we're able to share something that has happened to us with, with a trusted adult that we care about. Um, the other thing is um, often when people have experienced sexual abuse, you know, um, hostile relationships, we could start to believe a lot of lies about ourselves. And we could start to think, well, it was my fault. Or, well, it happened because I did this or that. Again, recognize it is not your fault. It does not define you. God restores us, and that's what we're talking about this weekend. Seek help. Talk to someone you trust. Know that God doesn't think of you any less. And God is with you in that pain, in that trauma, and everything you've been through. And no, you are not alone. Yeah, and just like if somebody has done something to you, that's not your fault. Like, like I was saying, like you don't have to forgive yourself for something that somebody else did. Like, it was not your fault. Now, forgiving the other person is another story. It wasn't exactly what they were asking, but can be extremely difficult. And forgiving somebody is not saying that you're excusing them. Like the action, like, it's not making it okay. Um, it's just saying like, I'm, I'm letting go of this. I'm not going to hold on to this anymore. Um, I hope that you will seek forgiveness for this. You know, and, and having that, it's a, it's a perspective of like, um, I, I want what's best for you, even though you've hurt me. And that can be a very difficult thing to do. And, and might take a long time, but it's not excusing the person to forgive them, and you certainly don't need to be forgiven for something somebody else did to you. Mm -hmm. You don't need to go to confession 
to confess the sin of being hurt by somebody else. Now, if, you're, if it's turned into anger, which is justified, you know, like that is a normal reaction to that. You can confess the anger that you keep holding on to this, and that might help you to forgive the other person, to move past it. Um, but again, I, I mean, we keep going back to counseling. Like, I, there's so much trauma and, and drama and, and tragedy that's, that's happening in all of our lives, and to get help for it is not something to be embarrassed by. Awesome. That, that was a really, really great point. All right, do you, do you recommend any devotions to specific saints? Oh, lost that. Hold on. Um, do you re- recommend any devotions to specific saints for dealing with anxiety? Off the top of my mind, St. Diphna, I hope I'm saying that right, St. Diphna, uh, she is the patron saint for anxiety. Um, so I, and mental health in general. In mental health in general. Um, so you could certainly do a, nu- a novena. You could just Google novena to St. Diphna. Um, uh, at my parish, my whole youth group, we did a series on, on anxiety. Um, so we did a new vena together. So maybe you grab a group of friends, have a group message, do a new vena together to St. Diphna. Also, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, uh, she struggled um, just with melancholy, um, just with uh, lots of different things um, in her life. And she had a lot of trials as well. She dealt with a lot of grief. Um, there's lots of saints who had different trials, um, different sufferings, especially in regards to anxiety, battling peace. Um, so I would recommend just uh, go- Googling a few of, of those novenas. While you're looking at the next question, St. Padre Pio said, pray, hope, don't worry, which might seem a little trite and oversimplified, but uh, I, I think that idea of it, it, it can be that simple. It can be much more complex than that. Uh, but starting with that, like praying, hoping, and then, okay, this is outside of my control. I don't need to worry about that. Awesome. Okay, next question. How do you find balance between being a vessel for God and glorifying him while maintaining your mental health and setting boundaries and saying no? Great question. What was the beginning of that again? Sure. Sure. How do you find balance between being a vessel for God and glorifying him while maintaining your mental health and setting boundaries and saying no? (laughs) Yeah. Um, So I think first and foremost, when we, like when we are overcommitted, like I was sharing a little bit earlier, when we are overcommitted, um, it's almost like we can't do anything well or we can't be in the present moment. We can't kind of um, simply be and enjoy. Um, So I think when we're overcommitted, overextended, when we are literally cramming our schedules with so many different things, um, that's never good. Um, I think that can become unhealthy. Um, And again, recognizing boundaries. What gives you life? And maybe there's a lot of things that give you life. Awesome. Praise God for that. But being able to say no to some things and yes to the things that really give you life, that really inspire you, that really help you, I think just making that change. And if you're someone who has a really, really hard time saying no, just start slow. So start saying no to like that extra club meeting you have at school. Start saying no to another thing. So start small. And then I think by having balance, Good balance only brings us more peace. Only, in a way, lessens our anxiety, brings us more mindful of, of God. I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, and I think, too, just what are the things that we're doing that might be out of whack, out of balance? I mean, getting more involved with your youth group is probably a good thing, and less time on social media you know, kind of shifting where you're putting your importance and, and your schedule, like what, what is most important to you and, and getting those important things in first and then the other things can kind of fit in around it. 
as needed. But often I think a lot of times the unimportant or maybe even negative things fill up our schedule and then the important things like prayer or youth group or you know, spending time with quality friends and family, that gets pushed out to the side. So priorities. Great. Okay, just so you know, if you've been submitting questions on the app, there's some questions that only look like a half question. So maybe you like hit submit too fast and you only typed out half of your question. I wanna make sure to address and, and, and get to these questions as well. Um, all right, how, how do you find peace when you or someone you love gets sick and all of your prayers and the treatments don't bring a cure? Great, 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 great question, great question. I'll just share a little personally. My mom was sick for a long time, nearly five years, and she was in the hospital for all five of those years. Um, it, it was heartbreaking. Um, uh, it is heartbreaking to watch someone you love sick. I think we all can agree on that. Um, and I think... Um, when we pray, especially pray for a miracle, um, pray that someone who's sick, that they get better, that their life returns to normal, and then it doesn't happen, it almost, sometimes I think we could have this human reaction like, well, God is cruel because he didn't answer my prayer. Um, and that's not it at all. God is not cruel. It's recognizing and coming to understand that the Lord's timing and allowing someone to suffer and maybe witnessing to that, that suffering or that sickness or that treatment they're going through, being able to witness to that, how they are showing us and like paving the path for us to experience God in a more profound way. You know, I think about when my mom was sick, if I didn't have my faith, I would have lost it. So recognizing and having understanding this is an opportunity to actually go deeper in our relationship with the Lord. This is an opportunity to lean in, to press in. Like, God, what are you showing me through sickness? God, what are you showing me through the, this war? God, what are you showing me through these horrible things that are happening in our society? You know, rather than looking at it as, you know, God didn't answer my prayer, and I, I get, you know, we see it that way. But being able to use it, like, God, I need to lean into you more. God, help me to trust you more. God, I'm struggling. Help me to know you are there. Again, sickness, illness, um, it, it is shattering, especially with people in our family, people we're close to. Um, but recognizing, like, God is God. God is with us. God is never going to leave us. God is never going to forsake us. I think, I think we're out of time. We are out of time. Um, hey, we, uh, be happy, side stage, talk to anyone, one-on-one, -on -one, whatever. Um, Y'all will definitely be praying for your peace and that this weekend God is able to restore peace in your life in any way. Let's just say a Hail Mary together as we are... Um, exit and continue to walk out.